with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will be in joy and come you. Take it and there you will go. Precious game of speed, hope of birth and joy again. Precious game of sweet, the hope of earth and joy of heaven. On the third, oh, the precious name of Jesus. How it thrills our souls with joy when his loving arms receive us and his songs and songs and glory. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet. of earth and joy of heaven. On the fourth, at the name of Jesus bowing, falling prostrate at his feet. <clears throat> King of kings in heaven crown him when our journey is complete. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven, precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. Amen, amen. What a precious name. Now let us turn to 434. Revive us again. 434, revive us again. We will do the first verse and the fourth verse. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now born above. Hallelujah, thy name. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with thy from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. I need to turn my mic on. There we go. And uh, we trust you're doing well. I like your shirts, Steve and Debbie. They have shirts on that say the greatest mistake you can make is to die without Jesus. I don't know where your never-ending shirts come from, but uh, do, you have, do you all have a shop in your house that you just crank them out? Timu, that's right. You all are the Timu king and queen. I forgot about that. But they, uh, they always have some kind of shirt that they, they match it together. But I can't think of a greater message to have on a shirt than that. So very good and powerful. And, very true. Yeah, very true. And uh, we're praying for you folks. Heard uh, Debbie from Debbie this morning that everything's a go for Thursday, right? Okay, so the, the shoulder surgery should be happening this Thursday, correct? Okay, well, we're praying for you then regarding that. And uh, it's good to be together. Thank you for coming out for our, our evening service. And uh, we are jumping into 2 Corinthians tonight. I'm excited about that. We finished 1 Corinthians. Now we're just going to continue on right into 2 Corinthians. And I will tell you, the tone of the book and the outlook of the book is so much sunnier than 1 Corinthians. So I figured it's only right. We, we plowed through 1 Corinthians and all the difficulty that is in that book. I felt it would only be right that we get into the brighter days of 2 Corinthians. And so that's what we're going to be spending our time tonight and for the next while on Sunday evenings. Thank you for coming back. 
Let's pray and let's ask the Lord's blessing on this service tonight. Lord, we thank you for this time to be together this evening and to look into uh, your word yet again. Thank you for these who have come out. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would use this service tonight in a very special way, in a helpful way. And Lord, I ask that uh, you'd be glorified in all that is happening here. I pray that uh, the message would be relevant and encouraging, and I pray that we would uh, grow from what we uh, learn this evening. Uh, be with those, Lord, uh, who might have some sickness or other things going on, and I ask that you would help us here tonight right where we are. We thank you and love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm going to ask our ushers to come to the front. We had a good VBS meeting this morning after the morning service, and we were able to uh, get most of our teachers uh, determined, and I believe there's still one more class, and I'm going to get an email out about that tomorrow to kind of let people know what uh, are some areas where we could still use some help, and uh, we are just two months away from Vacation Bible School, so we're going to be looking forward to that, praying about it, and in the meantime, there's other things that we are looking forward to as well, camps and uh, exciting opportunities to just, you know, serve the Lord and to be together as a church as we enter into the summertime. Sign up uh, for VBS. If you've not done so, sign up for Nicole's graduation party. That's something else we'd love to have you sign up for. And, uh, and then many other things to look forward to. Uh, just a, a, a note to write down or maybe put in your calendar is that on Thursday, June 20th, uh, we are going to have a Wednesday night service move to Thursday for that week. And we'll have West Coast Baptist College with us. They're going to be with us on Thursday night that week. So we'll move our midweek service and it should be a good service as we welcome them and uh, have some other things on the horizon to look forward to as well. It's time for us to collect the evening offering. Brother Matt Duncan, would you pray for the offering, please? Amen. Thank you very much, Sonny and Bethany. And thank you guys for your singing this evening. I had a frog develop in my throat on that last, last song in particular, but you guys were all singing very well. Uh, let us now turn uh, to 496 in the stand. Uh, this will be our chorus for the evening. Uh, no one ever cared for me like Jesus, which is such a great thing for us to share with one another and with the world. Um, 496, we'll sing the first verse, take a break, greet one another, and return for the third verse. <coughs> Cares for me. 
Please turn and greet one another. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated, and would you turn with me now to 2 Corinthians. It's been some time since we finished up 1 Corinthians, and then 
We just had a number of different things going on on Sunday nights. We went through our missions uh, month, and then we had Brother Chris preach through the Book of Ruth for us through the month of April. And uh, here we are now, and we are beginning a new book in 2 Corinthians. Now, I will readily admit, 1 Corinthians has some difficult portions to try to preach through and get through, and it's not easy, but I always want to be a preacher who preaches the whole counsel of God, so I didn't feel it would be right to skip any portions of the book. Uh, so we just, we preached and plowed our way through 1 Corinthians. Well, we now come to 2 Corinthians, and I believe we'll find it to be a great follow-up <coughs> to Paul's first letter. Uh, to the Corinthian church. And so we begin in 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, and we're going to read verses 1 through 12 this morning. I'm sorry, this evening. I can get my days and nights mixed up sometimes. But anyhow, let's, uh, let's start reading in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints, which are all in Achaia. Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer." Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came, into, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us, ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. So... Tonight, we're thinking about this, the God of all comfort. We see that phrase in verse 3. We might also think of the, uh, of the message this way, the blessing of being comforted. If there's a word that stands out to me in the verses I just read, it's that word comfort. And it doesn't appear just once or twice, several times. Comfort, comfort, comforted, uh, and being comforted, it just is mentioned in several ways throughout the very beginning part of this chapter. And so I think there is a theme that comes out, and that is God wants us to be comforted. And God wants to comfort us right where we are. Let's think about that as we pray and ask for uh, his help in the message. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time together tonight. I do pray in the few short moments that we have that this would be profitable to your people. I pray that we would see truth. I pray that we would... Uh, understand that no matter what we might be facing, that you are a God of consolation. You are a God of edification and encouragement. And yes, uh, we need to be chastised at times, and we need to be reprimanded, and much of your word has to do with reproving and rebuking. Uh, but Lord, I, pro I ask that we would also understand the importance and the blessing of consolation and i pray that we could see that this evening help us now i pray in jesus name amen if there was ever a church that paul had poured his heart and soul into it was the new church plant at corinth we find paul arriving there in acts chapter 18 where he earned his living as a tent maker he meant 
uh, a couple by the name of Aquila and Priscilla. And he just began to faithfully preach and teach Jesus Christ as he had in many other places. And soon, as had happened in many other places as well, a church sprouted up and was established. And Paul remained there longer than most other places. He stayed there for a full 18 months, faithfully pastoring and leading that church in the direction that God wanted it to go. Now, you might say 18 months, he was barely getting started. And yes, I understand that, but we have to know that Paul was not a, a pastor as we think of a pastor. He was a missionary evangelist. And so it was the nature of the Apostle Paul to go somewhere to see a church started and then to go on to the next town or the next place that God had called him and to see the, the process start all over again. As a matter of fact, that's really pure missions. Uh, we often talk about missions being Pauline, and I, I'm thankful for all missionaries, but really what I like to see in a missionary is someone who's going to go to a foreign land or go to a place and start a church and then maybe in that same country, go to another locality and start another church and then do the same thing over and over again. And that process might take a few months. It might take 18 months. It might take a year or more. But true missionary evangelism is going from place to place and starting churches. And that's what the Apostle Paul did. So you have to understand, 18 months, that's like very, very long for the Apostle Paul. Uh, maybe not long for one who is called the pastor, uh, but... You know, I think about myself, I've been here for 18 years, you know, and I still feel like I have uh, much that I'm looking forward to and much to accomplish in my pastoral ministry here. But Paul was there, and for him, that was a long period of time, and he really wanted to see this church go in the right direction. He would eventually move on then to Judea, and he'd conclude his second missionary journey, but he learns that after he leaves, the church had become overrun with sin, and it had gone astray, and I won't go into all the ways that it had sinned, but it was just a, a church of many, many problems. There was a lot of sin in the camp. There was many things that were not do, being done right. And so as Paul writes his first uh, epistle to the Corinthian church, it is a scathing epistle. It is a, an epistle of rebuke, and he's dealing with one issue after another. And so by and large, that's what he does in that first epistle to the Corinthians. It appears that Titus, who had been sent on Paul's behalf to this city and who had been given the initial problem report of the church, is sent back to them again with Paul's first letter. And after sharing Paul's letter, and I always wonder how those letters went with the local churches. Have you ever thought of that? You know, uh, especially a letter like 1 Corinthians, you know, Titus is sent from Paul and they finally get the, the church together. And maybe it's a service like this on a Sunday evening or sometime, and, and then he reads Paul's letter. But these letters, although they might not have fully known it at the time, had the weight of the inspiration of the Lord behind them as they were being read. And, uh, and they were just rebukes at times. And sometimes even certain names were called out in the letters. And uh, you talk about uh, quite an environment and <laughs> quite a service to be in. Those are probably some difficult services. Well, I can only imagine what it was like when 1 Corinthians was read as Titus went to visit them. Well, when Paul learns of this, he then writes his second letter to the Corinthians, and he learns just before writing this epistle, this second letter, that they had a right response. They didn't hear the, the epistle of rebuke and have the mindset that says that Paul all he wants to do is make our lives miserable. Forget him. We'll do things our own way. We don't need to hear what he has to say anyhow. We're even still wondering if he's actually an apostle. We'll, do, we'll go our own direction. No. They heard the rebuke. They received the instruction. And you know what they did? They began to get right the things that were wrong. And they began to make progress. That's always a wonderful thing. When people realize what has gone wrong... And then they begin to go in a right direction. Uh, do you remember when your kids were little, or maybe your kids are still little at home, and you have to discipline them? And, uh, you know, kids, they become unruly, and so sometimes you just have to discipline them. And, and they're unruly not just as little children. They can be unruly as teenagers and, and beyond. And our job as parents is to bring that rebuke and bring that correction into their lives. And 
You know, we had to do that with all of our children, and it seemed like it was always a struggle in the moment of disciplining them and trying to get them to see where they had gone wrong, and then, you know, dealing with that, disciplining that, and sometimes there were some tears, and, you know, there was, uh, uh, you know, just, just a hard lesson to be learned. But then after that, there's a sweet spirit. And after that discipline had been delivered and received, uh, often we found that, that there was peace, there was harmony, there was a right spirit again. And, by the way, if our homes are becoming turbulent, maybe there's a need for that. Uh, may, maybe it's not corporal punishment because your children are no longer that little, and, and, but they need to be dealt with in some way. And there needs to be some discipline brought into their lives and some punishment administered. And uh, if things are getting out of hand, our job as parents is to bring them back in and bring them back to where they need to be. I know we love our kids, but if we're just letting them do what they want and letting them go the way they want, what does the Bible tell us? Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. And listen, I feel like I have plenty of foolishness in my own heart. And uh, so just imagine what it's like in the life of a child. So children, they already have foolishness bound up in their heart. I've said this before, but the male brain, we understand now from science, I believe, is not fully developed until the age of 25. And so just think about all the course direction uh, that needs to be, did someone say 45? I thought I said 25. Did I say 45? I said 25. Mimi, you couldn't hear me correctly. I said 25. She just believes it's 45 because I turned 45 this year. That must be what it is. And, uh, <laughs> but anyhow, um, I will tell you, uh, they, uh, young people and uh, even you know, folks that are going into adolescence and beyond, they need direction. And this group of young baby Christians in Corinth, they needed that direction. And when Paul learns that they had a good response, he now follows that up with this second letter, and it has a completely different tone, and he begins the letter with words of comfort. And he mentions Jesus Christ, who he describes here as the God of all comfort. Look at verse 3 with me again. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. The word comfort here literally means to console or to make content. We might think of being consoled or encouraged or edified. We think of exhortation. Uh, that's what this letter begins with. Being comforted in the Lord is a vital necessity in the Christian life. As a matter of fact, we are to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine so yes uh, there is reproving there is rebuking but exhortation is also a part of administering the word of god and there needs to be exhortation brought in and uh, you pray for us preachers sometimes we can get a little negative <laughs> sometimes if we're not careful we love to reprove and rebuke and reprove and rebuke uh, but i'm always asking the lord to show me where where is exhortation needed and uh, we can't just pound people all the time. We need to build people up also. And uh, so there's a balance there, and there needs to be God-given direction there. And I think that's why this is a perfect book for us to get into. And on Sunday nights, I hope you come and you're feeling encouraged every Sunday night. I hope you're feeling built up and exhorted because that's what this series is all about. Being comforted is vital. And it's that comfort that can only be found from our Lord and Savior, Jesus. There are simply some times in life and some situations we face where honestly only Christ is capable of consoling us. We're not going to find that comfort in someone or something else, but Jesus, he'll be the one to, to deliver that to us. He is the God of all comfort, the word says here in verse 3. That means there's no difficulty he can't help us through. That means there's not one thing where he can't address the situation and build us back up and bring us back to that place of strength we need to be again because he's capable of all comfort in all situations and he never looks at us in any given situation and say, you know, it's hopeless. No, he knows what we need. 
and he can build us no matter where we are and comfort us right where we are. So let's look at several thoughts about this. Here's the first one. There is a reason for being comforted. And if you're taking notes tonight, you can write that down. Maybe you can write it in your Bible. There is a reason for being comforted. Now, part of the reason is so that we'll be happy in the Lord. No one wants to go through life down and beaten up and discouraged. Uh, we need to be built up in Christ. And the Lord wants his people to be edified and exhorted and helped and encouraged and consoled and all those good words. He wants that for us. But there's something even greater than just that, or there's another reason besides just our own feeling, or feelings, I should say. It goes beyond just that. Notice verse 4. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. One of the reasons for being comforted is so that we can, in turn, comfort others. When we have gone through something and the Lord has helped us through that, you know what that does? It puts us in a prime position to be a help, to be a blessing, to be an encouragement to somebody who might be in the same situation we had found ourselves in before. You see, the goodness of God is not for us to keep unto ourselves, but to use so that we might be a help and a blessing to other people. And so right now, maybe you're not in so much of a comforting time. Maybe you're in a difficult time. But understand that God can use that and he can bring you through that so that then you can be that source of encouragement to somebody who's going to be going through the exact same thing sometime down the road. Did you know that the Bible tells us there's nothing new under the sun? Now, it's hard for me to believe that sometimes because sometimes I'm in situations where I think no one's been through this before. No one's been in this exact place before. This is a complete, unique situation to all the billions of people who have lived and are living in our world to just Eric Hastings. There's no one anywhere but me who's going through this. You ever get that Charlie Brown complex sometimes? And uh, it's just, eh, woe is me, and things aren't going right. And I just, no matter what, it can't, it can't go right. And just by the time you think you're going to have some fun in life, Lucy pulls the football and you're on your back, Right? And, uh, and we have to avoid that Charlie Brown syndrome sometimes because we do sometimes personalize our issues and problems and magnify them to where we think it's only us, no one's ever been there, no one's ever been through it. That's why the Word of God's so helpful because it brings us back to square one. Wait a minute, nothing new under the sun, Christian. Nothing new under the sun. This has been done many times before. This has happened many times before in people's lives, and you need to understand that. Now look at verse 5. For the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. So we will go through those times of suffering, but understand that the more we suffer, the more we are then able to be comforted, and the more that we can therefore help others. Verse 6, and whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same suffering sufferings which we also suffer or whether we be comforted it is for your consolation and salvation and so in verse 6 we see that the suffering and affliction that we must endure is not simply for our benefit alone but it is for somebody else's uh, tonight on a sunday night i'm glad that uh, we meet and greet yet again and we get to know each other and we spend time with one another and we talk to one another uh, I like that when we come back for a Sunday night service, there's more fellowship happening, and we get to know each other just a little more, and we talk to each other just a little more. Why? Because we're a family. We're a local church family. And in a family, you're growing together. You're knowing more of one another. Uh, you, are, you are binding together. It ought to be that way in a local church. We should be growing together. And... Why The reason that's helpful is because as you get to know people, uh, you'll find out maybe something they're experiencing that's uh, maybe a trial, or maybe there's um, just a, an obstacle that they're dealing with, or maybe there's something they don't have an answer from God yet on. And, and you know what you can do? You can be that source of comfort in their life. And you can tell them, you know what, that sounds like exactly what we went through just last year. 
Or we, we dealt with this same exact issue, and let, let me tell you what the Lord did in our lives around that thing. Uh, let me tell you how the Lord brought us through and where we're at now. And you know what that can do? That can really help somebody. Now, I wouldn't say that all your business is everybody's business, okay? There are some personal things that we just keep personal because they're of a very deeply personal nature. And can I say something? That's okay. The, the, the message here is not share all your business with everybody so that everybody can know everything about you and they'll be really comforted by that. They might be less comforted by that. But what it is saying is you can take some things that are universal, some things that maybe are, you know, you know not just really very specific to any one person or or thing, but maybe general things that people generally go through that aren't of a deeply personal nature, and you can say, this is something I've dealt with, this is something that we've experienced, and, uh, and it's general in, in many ways, and it's not something that's personal and can't be shared, but I want to share it with you to help you where you are. And I want to let you know that the Lord can bring you through just like he brought us through. Amen? And so uh, that's one of the reasons why we go through what we do. Uh, the Lord even said this to us about himself. Hebrews 4, uh, 15 tells us, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. It's comforting for me, and I'm sure it is for you, to know that when Jesus was here on earth, he was tempted in every single way that man has ever been tempted. In everything that we have faced or man has faced from the beginning of time, uh, as far as sin is concerned, or uh, not sin in Jesus' life, but as far as temptation to sin is concerned, Jesus faced that. And yet, he did so without sin. He knows exactly what we're going through. We can't look at Jesus and say, you don't know what it's like to be human. He is human. Uh, you don't know what it's like to go through what I'm facing. Oh, yes, he does. And he's been through it all. And he knows exactly where you are. And the good thing is, uh, you don't have a God who doesn't care. You don't have a God who doesn't want to comfort you. He knows exactly where you are, and he wants to comfort you right where you are. So, praise the Lord for that. Here's the second thought. There is a rest in our soul when we are comforted. When God intervenes in our situation and begins to comfort us, there's a peace, there's a rest that comes to our soul. Listen to this. Regardless of what we're still facing. And, and that's the wonderful thing about this. The comfort that God brings isn't something that is finally realized or delivered when we're through it. No, it's right there in the midst of it. And the situation might not even be resolved yet. Maybe far from it. The difficulty may still be very big or large in our life, but it's in that. It's in the suffering and the difficulty that God brings us comfort. And that's what's wonderful about the consolation of the Lord. He, he delivers it to us while we're in it. We don't get through it and then say, oh, Lord, thank you that now you're exhorting me. While we're in the fight, the Lord's bringing himself to us and helping us where we are. Verse 7, and our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the suffering, so shall ye be also of the consolation. Yes, God's people go through hard things, but God's people are always comforted at the time of the trial and the time of the testing. That's what he talks to us about here. You're partakers of the suffering, but remember, you'll also be of the consolation. Verse 8, we see, for we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. He didn't want the church at Corinth to think that they were the ones who went through a hard time in trying to learn how to be the church of the Lord. He said, we've gone through it too. You're not the only ones who have realized that life isn't rosy all the time. He says, look at us. You might not realize it, but when we came to Asia, we were pressed out of measure above strength. We despaired even of life. None of us even wanted to live any longer. That's how hard things were. Verse 9, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. Because if it was up to us, we would die. But you know, our God didn't want us to die then. Our God wanted us to still live for him. 
And so we move on. But there were troubles in Ephesus, let me tell you. And I won't go into all the troubles they faced in Ephesus and in Asia, but there was Demetrius, the silversmith. There was Alexander, the coppersmith. There were all these smiths that were just causing all kinds of trouble. Now, if you're a smith tonight, thank you for your work. Uh, but there were some smiths that were up to no good, and they were causing some problems in the early church and uh, all kinds of difficulty. And it had also been widely believed that Paul was made to stand before a wild beast on an occasion or two, uh, and maybe that's some of what he's referring to also. In 1 Corinthians 15, 32, he says, this, If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage it, it me if the dead rise not? Perhaps that's a reference to that. But even in 2 Timothy 4, 17, he says, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. So Paul had been through so much, maybe even wild beasts, maybe even a lion, and he was spared from. Needless to say, we can see how Paul and his company despaired of their own lives considering their circumstances. And although they despaired and had the sentence of death, here's the truth. They were not dead. Amen? Now, maybe people get really down and discouraged and think, I'd be better off dead. First of all, that's stinking thinking. Wipe that out of your mind right now. It, because if God wanted you dead, you would be dead. You ever thought about that? If God wanted you to be dead, you'd be dead. And, and so don't despair of life and don't get to that down in the dumps place where you think it's not worthy. I, I, I hope I'll just die or maybe I'll try to just die. No, listen, God has his time for you. And God does not call us to fall over and die. He calls us to live for him. And then when he wants us to die, he'll, he'll do his job at that. Don't worry. He's, he's been successful, you know, or we've been successful really at dying because of our sin. It is appointed unto man, man wants to die. But until it's our appointment with death, what do we do? We, we go on. And Paul said, we snapped out of it. Yeah, we wanted to, everything to end, but it wasn't God's will for us to have that happen. God had not called us to that time of death yet. And so we're going to continue on for him. And so rather than die, here's what they did. They just trusted in God. Now, I understand this can sometimes come across, boy, that's good preaching, but when we're in the middle of that time where we're really down, I, I, I understand. I, I know what you're saying. I, I know where you might really feel very, very down or even depressed, but notice what he said. He said, we had this sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves. Don't trust in yourself because you'll let yourself down. As spiritual of a man as Paul was at this point, he said, we didn't have it right. I, want, I despaired and, didn't, and just didn't want to live any longer, but I couldn't trust myself. So what I did was we trusted in God who raises the dead. Notice verse 10, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. God is the great deliverer. And Paul uses this previous example as an opportunity to comfort the Corinthian Christians. What a good lesson. What a good lesson. Corinthians, you've been through it. You've really, really messed up the start of this church in a lot of ways, but you're not done. Aren't you glad God's not done when we mess up? You're not done, Corinthians. As a matter of fact, you have a wonderful opportunity to go on and shine brightly for me and to get all of the mess sorted out. And as a matter of fact, we've received word, Corinthian church, that that's exactly what we're doing, what you're doing, and we couldn't be happier. So we want to just send you a little bit of encouragement to let you know you're doing good. A good lesson for all of us in this is to remember, let's refrain from, thrusting, from fussing about our difficulties while we're in the midst of them. Because honestly, I, I've never heard anyone who has who said, I fussed and complained about my, my struggle in life, and it was exactly what I needed. Now, you might need to cry it out. Okay, that's okay. God gave us tears to let it out. But going on and fussing and complaining about your life and your difficulties isn't going to do you or anyone else any good at all. But 
what you can do is you can reference them after the Lord has brought you through and look at how faithful God was. And what, you'll con what you can do then is be in a position to comfort whoever else is going through the same thing. Here's the third and final thought. There is a wonderful result of being comforted. The answered prayer being brought through our trouble. Paul says we were delivered. Verse 11, ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. He says we despaired and we were down, but we felt your prayers. So one of the results of being comforted is we see answered prayer. One of the things I love to see, and we sometimes, I don't think, spend enough time on this, is when we see uh, a written prayer request be moved from a prayer request list to the praise list. And it's no longer a prayer request, but now it's a praise. And, he's, and we say, look, look, God answered. And, and I think I'm guilty of it. Just, well, praise the Lord. That, you know, that's, a, that's now a praise. No, let's really say, hey, folks, we've been praying about this for months, maybe years, and now look at it. It's no longer a prayer request, but it's a praise. We're no longer praying and asking God to answer because he has answered, and we can praise God that he's answered. Let's really take some time to notice when God does that. And, uh, yes, I'm, I'm all for prayer requests, but let's be, praise the Lord as much as we're praying to him. And, uh, and I think we need both things. By the way, uh, we have our last night of King's Kids and our last night of Flyers Club happening, uh, well, yeah, happening this week, and the last night of youth group happening this week, and the youth will be down, uh, and they'll have their final night. And then after that, you know what we're doing? We're continuing right on on Wednesday nights all through the summertime. Uh, don't fall off Wednesday nights during the summertime. You know why? Because you need to be here to hear while God's working in our midst. And we need to hear your prayer requests, and we need to see the praises that you bring, and now, I've talked about this with some of you. Wednesday nights, and it's a needed time. Because we're in the middle of the week then. We're in the midst of the week. We're in the midst of the battle and the trial, whatever it is we're facing. We need that time. Dad, mom, grandma, grandpa, whatever defines you tonight, get here on Wednesday nights all summer long. You need to be here. And we need you here. And even if, even if you have children that are uh, a little bit older. They can sit with you. They can learn to pray. They can learn to share a prayer request. We'll make it applicable to everybody on Wednesday evenings. And then we'll have something for the children downstairs, the young ones, age two through age five. I I'm just simply sharing this. Don't forsake meeting during the summertime on Wednesday nights and think that you don't need that time. You need that time. Wednesday nights is just not a time during the school year for your kids to go have a, a fun club and to kind of pass the time along during the week. No, Wednesday nights is a needed service of the local church. So I encourage you to be here for that because what we see is we see God answering prayer in those times of prayer services. One of the other wonderful results of being comforted is then the closeness of God's people in intercessory prayer. There's a cooperation, there's a unity that develops around those things. Now, we share prayer requests and connection classes and prayer meetings and at other times, but that midweek prayer service, that's where we really spend time to look at the prayer list and see what's coming up. And we've been praying for months about Debbie and her shoulder. And now one of the reasons we're rejoicing is that it looks like she's going to get to have this surgery on Thursday, right? Unless something unforeseen happens. Well, how do we know all that? Why are we all focused on that? Well, because for months we've been praying about that, but if if we've missed being here in the middle of the week, we might not even know that. So there's that family bonding time that happens around prayer and intercessory prayer. And he says, listen, you helped us, church, by praying for us. We are also helped and comforted by others. And then there is a sweet spirit and a genuine gratitude, and God is glorified. He even mentions a gift that was bestowed upon them by, <clears throat> by the means of many persons. Thanks be given on behalf, on many, uh, on our behalf. Uh, there's something special in the way that God uses a family, especially the family of God, to take care of one another. And Paul was always careful to give gratitude and thanks for that. And to say, you helped us. We're giving you thanks. You've, you, you've comforted us in some ways. And uh, we need each other. That's what the local church is. It's a family 
that needs one another. And uh, may God help us to understand that and to know that. And you know what I hope tonight, what is accomplished tonight? I hope that you're comforted tonight. And maybe tonight you're going through something that is hard, but you heard something tonight, and that is the Lord knows where you are, and he can do some things that help you right where you are. Don't despair. Don't give up. Don't say what's the use. Listen, it's right at that time where God's about to do something marvelous. So believe him and trust him and know that he's working. See how he's working. Understand the blessing of the people of God and being a part of a local church family. Don't dismiss it. Don't think that you don't need it. Sometimes there are folks and they've been a part of the church for years but they still, after years, maybe even decades, view their involvement in church as their great blessing to the church. And there are folks for years that I've been trying to help understand, yes, you're a blessing, but you need to understand you need the blessing of this place also. You're not just God's blessing to this place. This place is God's blessing to you. Please see that. Please help others to see that. When you group of, get a group of folks together with that kind of a humble spirit and attitude, you know what happens? God takes the reins and he helps us and comforts us along the way. And, you know, we're only here for a short time in this life. But while we're here, let's, let's make it worthwhile. Let's make it enjoyable. You want to come to the end of your life and have it be said of you, man, yeah, I mean, he was saved, but he was so cranky. Yeah, he made it to heaven, but boy, I don't see him smile very much. Yeah, she's in a much better place now, but man, she never talked about how good things were and how good God was in her life. It was always how bad things were. I can promise you, none of us want that testimony. So let's ask God for the opposite. Let's ask God to be good in our life and then show that goodness to others and, and, and comfort others as the way, in the way that God has comforted us. Amen? Let's bow our head and close our eyes together. Lord, help us tonight. Thank you for your word. I pray that this was an encouraging message. We need to be encouraged. Sometimes... We forget that. Maybe we forget that in our own life. And maybe there's some people here tonight, they've just been complaining far more than they should. And it's time to stop the complaining and start the rejoicing. If you'll just look closely, you'll see how good God has been. Maybe you don't even have to look that closely, you just need to look. Some of us have gone through some things, but we're in a place where we can help others. And if you'll get involved in that work of comforting and encouraging others, you know what it'll do? It'll help you. And the prayers of these people, this Corinthian church, even though they had started wrong, they, they started to get it right, and their prayers ended up helping the one who had to write them the difficult letter. And their gift that they sent his way helped him. We always think that it was Paul trying to get everyone in line and make sure the churches knew what they needed and they, they were greatly helped and moved along by him. But Paul on many occasions writes to them how much he needed them as well. And I, as your pastor tonight, am telling you, I need you people. I need this church. We need one another. Let's show the love of Christ to one another in this place. And let's watch how the love of Christ can grow and do great things in our midst. Father, help us now. Speak to our hearts in this invitation. May we take a moment or two to respond as you prompted us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand with me, please, quietly?
I'd like to ask Bethany to play a verse or two of invitation. And as she does, let's take a moment to talk to the Lord. Maybe we just need to speak to our Father, to speak to our Savior, to be encouraged a bit tonight. Maybe there's some encouragement that's needed. Listen, the Lord knows exactly what you need. He loves you. He cares for you. He knows where you are. Maybe you need to comfort someone else. Maybe it's time to pray for someone and receive the the goodness of God in your life and see how the prayers of someone else has helped you. May we be comforted this evening. Aren't you thankful for the Lord and His grace? And uh, boy, I need His grace every day. How about you? And uh, let's remember that this week. Uh, If there's ever a comforting thought, it's that God's grace abounds. And uh, so let's live with that thought in our heart. Uh, Regardless of what you've done, uh, if you've trusted in Christ and and you've accepted His forgiveness, you're forgiven. And let's keep short sin accounts with the Lord. Let's keep in a close relationship with him. Let's have a great week this week. And, uh, you know, the month of May is a transitional time. School's about to end, going into summer, things, you know, movement and things happening. But it can also be a wonderful time of reaping and watching how God has worked through a school year or how, how the start of the year has gone up to this point and looking forward to the summer and the things that are ahead in the summertime. I love the summertime. And uh, there's, there's some bright days ahead for us. So let's be excited about what God's doing. Let's attack this week. Let's wear a smile on our face. And let's comfort one another in the Lord. Amen. And uh, I need it from you. I hope you can receive it from me and from one another. And uh, let's go forward doing great things for God. And uh, we'll trust him to help us as we go. Let's be dismissed now in a word of prayer. And uh, Brother Roger, would you dismiss us, please? Roger, you're a comforter. Thank you for that prayer.